If you have a Bible, would you turn in it please to Mark chapter 11, verse 27. In the blue Bible, in the back of the pew in front of you there, it's page 717, 717. Mark the 11th chapter, verse 27, and we will read through verse 28. The scene here is one of confrontation. Jesus is in the temple in a very public fashion for the second time, at least the second time uh, with this type of situation. Jesus cleared out the temple on two occasions previous to this. Uh, there were money changers there that would take exorbitant cuts out of the, the funds of poor people who were required to purchase certain types of animals to fulfill the sacrificial requirements there at the temple. And so the priests were making lots and lots of money off of people that could not afford to pay it. And so Jesus cleared the place out on two occasions. He is returned now to talk to the religious leaders and this is what happened. Verse 27, they arrived, meaning Jesus and his disciples, again in Jerusalem. And while Jesus was walking in the temple courts, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders came to him. By what authority are you doing these things, they asked. And who gave you authority to do this? Now, I am sure that none of the children listening today have ever done what I'm about to describe, so we're all okay. But picture the scene with me, if you will. Uh, maybe seven, eight, nine years old, okay? Bob uh, might be a little girl, might be a little boy. Maybe they have siblings, a brother or a sister. And let's say that the little boy or little girl goes and takes a toy that they should not take. And the offended sibling, let's say it's a sister, uh, rushes over towards the brother or sister that stole the toy and said, Give that back! You can't take that! And the thief puts their hands on their hips and says, Says who? Now children, I know that you've never said that. I know that you never will. But we've all heard of people, right, that have said that, right? Says who? With the look of defiance. And actually, in spite of the nasty attitude that is usually behind those particular words, it is a very good question. Says who? Whose authority are you using to tell me that I can or cannot do something? You know, essentially, this is the same question that the leaders of the Jewish people were asking Jesus. Says who? Who says, Jesus, that you can clear this place out like you did? Who says that you can come and teach the people and tell them to do things that we have told them not to do? Who says? Says who, Jesus? It's a great question. The question of authority. The question of who will we follow what will we follow? Why do we do the things that we do? Says who is an excellent question to ask. Which is why to me it's so stunning that there are so many people who don't ask it. Now, I don't want to paint with too broad of a brush here. I know that there are many people that, that carefully consider before they make major decisions in their lives. But there are also many people that do not. They do not ask the question, says who, about most anything. Uh, they will make very important decisions, uh, 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 what uh, school to go to, uh, who to marry, uh, who, who, who to date, what kind of career to get into, should we have children, if so, how many, is now the time, how should we invest our money, what to do with spiritual things. And they will make these decisions without any sort of thought to says who. In other words, without considering whether the authority they are resting their decision on is a trustworthy one. Now, there are a variety of reasons why this question of says who is so important. 
not the least of which is that actually there are only a handful of authorities to choose from. You might be thinking, now hold on a second, how can that be, Pastor Shane? I mean, if I, if I Google something uh, instantly, in a, in, a, in a nanosecond, I get uh, 1.3 bazillion responses to my query. All of them telling me the absolute truth about what it is that I'm looking for, right? Now, aren't there are all kinds of authorities out there. And I would say, well, sure, Google might tell you that, but ultimately, I think it all boils down to three choices. Three choices. If you're going to answer the question of says who, you really only have three options from which to choose. Uh, the first option is ourselves. Isn't that true? It's, it's ourselves. Uh, we are the ones that will make the decisions, usually in a vacuum, all on our own. I think thus and such, we say with great conviction. I believe this and that to be true, we say with, with, with energy and enthusiasm, which is all fine until someone disagrees with you. Someone who perhaps has also selected themselves as the be-all and end-all, the answer to says who, and now they say something that is different than what you have said, and who is to say that your opinion is any better than theirs, if that's all it is? Now, this is a genuine issue. After all, <laughs> if merely stating an opinion makes it true, God help us all. And yet so much of what we hear on radio, television, read and print is precisely that. People make millions of dollars every year, at least in American society, my guess is around the rest of the world too, in stating nothing more than their opinion based on nothing else than their own particular wisdom. And this is a huge issue because again, if merely stating an opinion makes it true, God help us all. And by the way, this is true whether you are religious or not. Uh, some time ago I was listening uh, to National Public Radio. Uh, it was mid-morning, there was a show on that was interviewing a, a specialist in genetic research. He was a geneticist. And uh, he was, uh, in the introduction to the interview, uh, the interviewer asked uh, this doctor, this researcher, some questions about ethics. Now, as you might imagine, genetic research probably raises some ethical questions, right? Uh, the whole idea of cloning, uh, the whole idea of the of manipulation of, of human DNA. These are some pretty serious issues uh, that right now there are no particular answers to. And this scientist, who was not religious, said there is currently no organized ethic for making decisions as to what is right and what is wrong in advanced genetic research. And immediately, you know, my antenna go up. I mean, that's that's, that's kind of my area, right? I mean, I, 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 have, I have spent my life talking about things that are, that are good for us and trying to avoid that which is bad. And so my ears go up and I thought, okay, this is going to be great. I'm curious what the discussion is going to be after this. And wouldn't you know it? The moderator in the discussion immediately changed the topic and went on to something else. Now, in NPR world, that's just because they say that's common sense. Because, you know, you just need to move on from the topic because the scientist made this statement. Religion will have no part in developing an ethic for genetic research. And I imagine, although I couldn't see it, it was on the radio, I imagine everybody nodded their head, of course, that, that's exactly right, that's what we should do. Well. I had heard one too many shows like this, and so I got on the phone and I called NPR. And uh, I got the call screener, and I, uh, she said, uh, uh, thanks for calling, name the program, etc. Uh, what is your question for our guest? And I said, well, I would like to ask, since your guest has excluded religion from, the base, from being the basis of his ethics, on what basis then will he determine what is appropriate to do and not to do? In other words, I was asking, what is the guest's answer to says who? <laughs> and the screener was thoughtful for about a millisecond, hmm, and then said, uh, sir, I'm sorry, but that seems a little too abstract to discuss on the air with our guest. Thank you for calling. <sighs> you 
Now, in the South, we would say, bless her heart. <laughs> I am sure that she was doing her job to the best of her ability. But truth be told, she blew an excellent opportunity. Because the question that I asked is precisely the question, not only that, that, that the conversation needed to deal with, but indeed it could not avoid, and I was vindicated because the last five minutes of the show, just before they, they cut to whatever the next program was, was spent on precisely that question. It had circled back because you can't get around it. When you're dealing with these types of issues, at some point somebody's going to have to say, this is right and this is wrong. This we will do and this we will not. You see, even thinking people know whether they're religious or not, that when it comes to real life and real decisions, personal opinion alone cannot carry the day. Small wonder then that this geneticist at the end of the program, I don't remember the exact quotes, but this, this is the true essence of what he finished with. He said, I don't know how we will figure out a basis for making ethical decisions in genetic research, but I do know that we need to find a way that goes beyond the individual scientist. He said that. <laughs> Because he knows that there are some scientists that if you pay them enough money, they will not concern themselves with something as insignificant as the ethics of their research. You know, what's particularly interesting to me is that that scientist was actually simply echoing the word of God, though I'm sure he did not know it, from many, many years in the past. Would you flip back, please, to Joshua chapter 24, verse 14? Joshua 24 Verse 14. It's page 169 in your blue Bible. Let me paint the scene here for you. Joshua is essentially in chapter 24, and actually a little bit before that too, giving his, his last will and testament. He is near the end of his life, uh, roughly 110 years of age by this time. He has led the children of Israel through thick and thin, the taking of the promised land. Uh, they, they have been through it all, and now it is all done, essentially. Uh, people have begun to move into the promised land. They've taken the portions that are allotted to the various tribes, including his. Uh, and now he is, he is giving his, his last words to them, exhorting them to follow the Lord. He reminds them of the covenant that they've made with the Lord to be his people. And in the process of doing that, we find verses 14 and 15. Joshua says, Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your forefathers worship beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to, to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your forefathers served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, what? We will serve the Lord. Now, that's a powerful statement. There's a reason why this is one of the more famous portions of the Old Testament. We quote this one, and we quote it frequently, and for good reason. I mean, here's Joshua. I mean, saying at the end of his life, in spite of all that we have been to, all the opposition, etc., etc., I will still serve God. You can't take that away from me. And we miss something profound that Joshua has said just a few words earlier. You see, he said in verse 15, but if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your forefathers served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. Did you notice what he didn't say? If serving the Lord <coughs> doesn't seem like a good idea to you, why don't you just make up your own minds? Why don't you just be your own authority? You see, Joshua knew something. He had been with these people long enough that he knew something about humanity that we often forget. He knew that no one can really hide inside of their own brain like some isolated little, little cavern that's away from everybody else. Sooner or later, people will choose something outside of themselves. And so he simply goes through the logical things. Well, if you're not going to serve God... I know you're not going to just stick inside your own head. You're going to pick other gods. So, you know, here's what you got. This one over here, this one back over the river. You can choose those gods there. Because Joshua knew the root of all lasting authority is outside of ourselves. Did you hear me? The root of all genuine authority is outside of ourselves. So, when it comes to important issues of our day, uh, 
We already talked about who you're going to marry. And you say, well, I want thus and so. Says who? I'm going to take on this career. Says who? Uh, I'm for abortion. I'm against abortion. Says who? I'm in favor of capital punishment. I'm against it. Says who? I'm going to vote for so-and-so in the election. Says who? It is astonishing to me how seemingly intelligent people can go forward in making profound decisions that have impacts not only on themselves but on their families and sometimes even on hundreds of thousands of other people around them based on no other authority than themselves. They forget that even the Bible testifies strongly that all genuine authority lies outside of ourselves. Yes, you are sovereign over yourself. Yes, you have a responsibility to make decisions for yourself. Absolutely, I have the same. But all genuine, lasting, transformational authority lies outside of us. Which brings us to option number two. If you're going to answer the question, says who? Who's going to be the great authority in my life or in your life? We can first choose ourselves, or second, we can choose other people. Other people. Now, some of you might sneer at that and say, well, that's just, that's just nasty peer pressure. We don't want to do that. I, I, I agree. There, there's certainly a measure of truth to that. But before we throw it out too quickly, let's understand something. Uh, when I go to the doctor, I'm really glad that there are other people that have authority in that office, embodied in the doctor himself. You know, there are very few doctors I know of that stay in business long that somebody comes in to see them and they say, oh, doctor, I have a pain right here. And he flips a coin, right? He says, well, I'm trying to decide, do I amputate at the neck or at the knee? You don't want that. You want to know that there's actually, you know, an academy of sciences. There's a body of research, of researchers that have, that have worked on this particular thing. And so this doctor is going to have derived authority from all of that research and bring it to bear on your situation. I kind of like that. I, I like the fact that there's a group of people that founded this nation. Uh, that, that took the time, for instance, to write up our Constitution. I think that's a pretty good thing. It's a group of people that I am willing to let answer certain questions when I say, says who? I don't mind pointing to the Constitution in a variety of circumstances. And of course, uh, teachers at the academy, teachers at the elementary school, that's a pretty good body of people. When someone says, well, says who? Well, Mr. Short said so. That's a good answer. That's a good answer. We ought to obey that. And then, of course, there's that group of people called mom and dad. And when they say that you ought not to take that toy from your sibling, you probably ought not to do it. It's not all bad by any means, trusting other people to answer that question of says who. But we must be careful. Because even doctors can go wrong sometimes. And even governments can go sour. And even teachers, no one here on campus, but in other places, teachers could go wrong and make poor decisions for their students. And parents, yes, even parents. We've all heard the tragic stories of how sometimes parents make decisions that harm their children. You know, Jesus pointed out something Matthew chapter 23, please. Page 700 in your blue Bible. Matthew, the 23rd chapter, verse 1. Jesus recognized that designated authority, well-designated authority, groups of people that have indeed been appropriately endowed with authority and that we should defer to, sometimes they go wrong. Jesus here, Matthew 23. You've got to picture the scene here. This, this is an incredible chapter. Jesus is surrounded uh, by people that would like nothing more than for him to be dead. Uh, the religious rulers, scribes, Pharisees, teachers of the law, etc., are all gathered around there. My guess is the, the, the scene here is not just a matter of dozens. My guess is there are hundreds of people gathered around. His disciples are there. Jesus' followers are there. And Jesus gets into it. 23, Matthew, 23rd chapter, verse 1. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, The teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. So you must obey them and do everything they tell you. But do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. 
Now the subtlety of this is, is, is fairly deep, so don't let this just go on by. In other words, Jesus is saying that the authority that, that these men are claiming, uh, the, the, the source is legitimate. What does he say? These men sit in whose seat? In Moses' seat. In other words, the law of Moses. He is referring back. The line of authority is good. So you need to obey them. But don't do what they do. In other words, there is an authority that exceeds this group of people. And you are beholden unto that source. And you must obey that source. Even if the people telling you to do otherwise don't obey it. You must obey the higher authority if the lower authority tells you to disobey the higher authority. I would suggest to you that Jesus is pointing to something that the world desperately needs. I think that the world, what the world needs, what I need, and if I could be so bold, what you need, is an authority that is outside of any group of people on this planet. An authority that is outside of our society, that is outside of church leadership, that is outside of this planet. What the world needs, what I need, what you need, is an authority that cannot be bought or sold. An authority that cannot be bribed to change itself. An authority that is not subject to opinion polls, to what your roommate thinks, to what I think, to what you think. An authority that is outside, that is objective. An authority that has proven for hundreds of years, thousands of years, that it has the best interest of humanity at heart. An authority that is consistent, that does not change, that has stood the test of time and circumstances. I would suggest to you that there is only one such authority. Flip over just a few pages. Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. These are Jesus' last words recorded in the book of Matthew. He is almost ready to ascend back to heaven. He has gone through his death. He has returned from the grave. He's gathered now with his 11 disciples. Matthew 28, 18, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. <laughs> you know, I am not aware of anyone else who has ever made a statement like this. Not one. Oh, we've had some arrogant people in the past. We all know about the, 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 the great dictators, quotes, great dictators in earth's history. They have all made these great claims, but not one of them has even bothered to attempt to say, and by the way, all the rest of the authority in the universe is mine too. Not a one, because they know they can't. They know they're isolated to this place, and yet here is Jesus. Jesus comes and he says, all of the authority on this place, all of it on the globe, has been given, has been given to me, and all of it outside of this planet is also mine. I want to suggest to you that the only authority that is truly objective, that is outside of us, that is not buyable, that cannot be bribed, bought, or sold, or changed, is Jesus Christ, as revealed by his Holy Spirit and in his word. That's it. Jesus is the only one that has ever been able to make this answer to the question of says who stick. He's the only one that could claim I am fully man and fully God and it's stuck. And through the Holy Spirit and his word this authority is clearly revealed. Now follow me carefully here. The Holy Spirit will reveal Jesus Christ to anybody that is willing I say again, the Holy Spirit will reveal Christ to anyone that is willing. The, the, the Spirit reveals uh, uh, Christ to us uh, sometimes in our quiet times, the devotional times, spending time in the Word. Sometimes you do not need to be quiet at all. Sometimes the Spirit breaks in loud and clear through the noise of our lives. Many times the Spirit breaks through into people's lives when they're not even looking for it. Isaiah tells us, you will hear a voice behind you telling you this is the way, anybody know how it ends? Walk ye in it. 
It's the voice of the Holy Spirit revealing who Christ is. Now, here's a problem. The trouble is, is that we human beings sometimes are a little bit more imaginative than we should be. And we think we hear things from the Holy Spirit that actually the Spirit never said. And that's why somebody who says, well, uh, I just listen to what the Spirit tells me to do and I use nothing else. They're, they're dangerous people. They're dangerous people. And so to ward off that danger, Christ in his wisdom also gave us this book. Because the book helps to clarify the voice of the Holy Spirit to us. Now, if somebody only reads the Bible and doesn't have the Holy Spirit, they're equally dangerous. Uh, the devil knows this book backwards and forwards, if I understand correctly, and it's not doing him one would of good, quite the opposite. So we cannot have one or the other. We must have both if we are to understand this authority, the ultimate answer here, to says who is Jesus Christ. And having said that, some of you listening now do not agree. And I think I probably understand at least a portion of your disagreement. Some of you, for instance, might be saying, ah, Shane, I understand this is a Christian church service. Of course you're going to refer to the Bible. It was expected. But don't you know that there are multitudes of other religions that have their holy books too? And they claim it is a divine revelation of divine will. Why should you trust this book? and not all the rest? That is a very good question. And I don't claim to be able to give you the exhaustive answer to that question, but I am going to give you some. And we're going to move quickly here. But I want you to see why it is that the Bible is indeed the ultimate written answer to the question of says who. Five things. Five reasons why I believe it is that the Bible is the ultimate written answer to the question of says who. Number one, archaeology. Every year there are professionally trained scientists, archaeologists, that in North Africa, in the Middle East, in Palestine, continually dig up more and more artifacts that confirm that what the Bible said happened actually did happen. People who say that Christianity, and that the Bible in particular, is the, you know, this, this mythological creation would do well to visit a Bible history museum. Because there you will see that there are actual things. Uh, they probably won't let you actually touch them. I understand that. But you can see them. Uh, you can look at them and you can tell. This actually tells us that what happened in this particular portion of the Bible really did happen. We have physical evidence that confirms the stories and events of the Bible. You say, well, how much is there? Uh, a number of years ago, the elders here gave me a, a gift which I have cherished ever since. Uh, it is a Bible, uh, and it is the Archaeological Study Bible put out by Zondervan. Uh, this is the New International Version. In fact, the text and the apparatus in the center of the page are identical in this Bible and in the Archaeological Bible. However, this Bible is right at a thousand pages long. Same text, same size font, almost 2,000 because they decided that they were going to put in a whole bunch of the evidence, writing down pictures, etc., of the archaeological support for Scripture, and it essentially doubled the size of the book. People who say that this is just a bunch of myth and legend, I say with all due respect, have not studied out archaeological evidence for Scripture. It's simply there, and a wealth of it as well. Reason number two, incredible unity. You say, well, what does that mean? Simply this. The Bible, uh, for those of you that study the Bible, you are aware that actually this, this quote's book is a compilation of, of 66 different books. Uh, we, we, uh, these sections, we call them books. It's like a small library here. 66 books, 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New, written over a period of 1,500 years roughly by 40-plus authors who had occupations that ranged from doctors to kings to statesmen to shepherds, tent makers, fishermen, clergy, and yet, despite this incredible diversity and long period of time in which the Bible was written, the theme is incredibly unified. It's almost like there was a single managing editor that lived through all 1,500 years of its publication. 
It's, it, this is something that is, it's, it's only stunning when you really sit down and are honest with it. If you're not honest with the text of Scripture, you'll just brush right over, oh yeah, so it talks about God. No, 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 no. Imagine over 1,500 years having all these different authors write about things where they seem to fit hand in a glove, and yet only a handful of the Bible writers actually knew each other. Only a handful actually lived during the same period of time. I mean, it's incredible the unity that is here. The story of Christ's uh, coming in the future is what dominates the Old Testament. The coming of the Messiah. The New Testament, the first portion, is dominated by what happened when the Messiah did come and then later on what the, how that played out into the Christian church and ultimately talking about how the Messiah will come the second time. The thread that runs through it, this golden thread, is incredible. And if you read, if you take the time to read from beginning to end, you will see this incredible diversity resulting in phenomenal unity. Reason number three. Straightforward writing style. Anyone who's read ancient mythology outside of the Bible knows that there's often this very flowery uh, language that is used. Uh, we're talking about uh, this kind of superhero status uh, you know, the uh, magic-like qualities of certain characters, the, uh, the Greek pantheon of gods, for instance, and the, these incredible feats that they perform and lightning strikes, etc., etc., from their hand. When you read the Bible, it's almost completely absent, particularly when it comes to the story of Jesus Christ. There, there's no jumping in a, in a phone booth and coming out with a, with a cape and an S on his shirt. I mean, it's, it's just not there. Instead, what you find is a very carefully written eyewitness account of the coming of Jesus Christ. And there's no flowery language. There's no trickery that's there. It's simply a straightforward account by people who saw it with their own two eyes. Reason number four. Fulfilled prophecy. Here is where the Bible kicks into overdrive and leaves every other book behind. In the Bible, there are hundreds of prophecies Dozens of them cover more than just a handful of years. Many of them are extremely complex. In other words, in order for them to be fulfilled, it would require the actions of certain nations, millions of people, to interact in certain specific ways over long periods of time. There is not a single prophecy in the Bible that has ever failed. Not one. You can take any other religious book, and it cannot hold a candle to the Bible in this regard. Not even close. There are other books that claim to make prophecy, uh, that, that claim to predict the future, but none of them have the Bible's track record. Again, not even close. Some weeks ago, we looked at just one prophecy, just one, the 70 weeks prophecy of Daniel chapter 9. It's incredibly intricate. It covers hundreds of years. It required incredible things to take place in a certain order, in a certain way, and every last one of them did. Every last one of them. People who say that the Bible is just another collection of legend simply do not understand about fulfilled prophecy. There is no book like the Bible. All of which leads me to the fifth and final reason that I'll share with you this morning, and that is changed lives. You see, people, when they come to the Bible, and particularly when they read the story of Jesus, and they read the Gospels, they tend to come out as different people on the other side. They are transformed by the Holy Spirit revealing Jesus in the, book, the pages of this book. The thief stops his thieving. The adulterer stops his adultery. Those that oppressed now become peacemakers. Those that once were in darkness now become bearers of Christ's light. The transformation that takes place because of what people find here, because of who people find in this book, is like nothing else that is out there. Nothing. There's a saying, <laughs> the Bible is an anvil that has worn out many a hammer. And it's true. The Bible to me is the ultimate written answer to the question of says who. So church family, I want to ask you a question. What is your answer to the question of says who? 
How are you making the important decisions in your life? How are you deciding about the, the, the decisions? How are you going about making the decisions that will lead to either great things or great peril for you, for your family, for other people? Is it just your opinion that you're using? I mean, you have a right to it, but is that all that it is? Have you perhaps put your trust in undependable groups of people? Or have you found a firm foundation in Jesus Christ as revealed by the Holy Spirit and the Bible? You see, in a world that is filled with mush, Jesus is the right answer to the question of says who. Yeah, church family, I want you to know that in the not too distant future, this local church and this worldwide church of Seventh-day Adventist is going to be facing some pretty serious issues. We live in unprecedented times. And the issues that are going to confront us, again, whether it be on this campus or worldwide, every last one of them will be impaired if all we have is our own opinion. I want to suggest to you that Jesus is still looking back and forth across the earth looking for those who are, whose hearts are fully devoted to him, looking for people who will not merely rely on their own wisdom, but have said, Jesus, you are my ultimate source of authority, and I will live for you and for your truth. That's who I think Jesus is looking for, particularly at this time in the church's history. The question remains then, will you be one of his Jesus, indeed, we do ask for this grace. Grace for our sins, yes. Grace for our shortcomings, yes. But, Lord, grace to be able to trust you more. So often, Lord, in the world today, there are people that are pontificating nothing more than their own opinion and yet declaring it to be almost of divine status. I pray, Lord, that we would filter those voices out and that in its place, with your God-given gift of wisdom and discernment, that you would be the answer to the question of says who. Bless us, Lord, in this way, for we've asked it in your name. Amen.